I'm Lou Copper, member of the Point Blank team, and I'm here today joined in the studio by the head of the school, JC, uh, for this week's edition of Friday Forum Live. So once again, for, for those that don't know, um, if you've never tuned in before, basically Friday Forum Live is, is your chance to get involved and learn a bit more about Point Blank, uh, what we do here, and um, just to get a bit more of, of an insight really. So um, please feel free to, to get involved in the chat room and ask any questions that you have, um, anything, whether it's the technical stuff um, for, that JC can answer, or if it's more general stuff about Point Blank, about the courses, um, then, then you know, just get posting and we'll do our best to, to answer your questions and all of them that come through. Um, so yeah, before I give you, um, well I'm going to give you a bit of an update about what's been going on with Point Blank, uh, what we've been up to this week, um, and then after that JC is going to jump in a tutorial, which this week we're going to cover mastering with, with Waves plugins, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Cool, so before we get into that, um, just to give you guys a bit of an update on what's going on. Um, first of all, the full range of online courses started on Monday, um, but um, we've actually added a new date for, for quite a lot of the programs. So if you go to the, the website, just click on the, the tab which says professional course programs, and you can see um, we've basically added an extra date for October 1st. Um, so I think that kind of that should be for like um, the logic courses, EMC course, Ableton courses, basically the, the courses that we find to be really popular that have, have filled up a lot. We're going to try and run them every two weeks now. Uh, so you've got more of a chance to jump on. Um, okay, what else have we got? Uh, a big thing that's, that's launched this week is um, we are now giving away an iPad 3. Uh, all you have to do to be in the chance with, with winning is to subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, which you should be doing already, bearing in mind that you're watching this live. Um, but yeah, just subscribe to the YouTube channel, tell your friends, and you can be in the chance of, of winning an iPad 3. Um, what else have we got? Okay, yeah, on Tuesday, we've got the next edition in our live music production masterclass series. Uh, so on Tuesday we'll be welcoming FOMO along, um, FOMO is a resident of Chew the Fat and, and We Love at Space in Ibiza. Um, he's had a lot of records out on, on the likes of Chew the Fat, uh, Trouble and Bass and, and quite a few different records, kind of makes the house and, and UK bass stuff. Um, so yeah, should be a wicked tutorial, I think he's going to be looking at an unreleased track um, using Ableton Live. Uh, so yeah, make sure you lock into that, that will be on Tuesday at about 4, four o'clock I think. Um, you can head over to the Facebook page and find out all the details, just hit up our um, BAT TV um, tab and you can find all the information um, about when it starts and how to watch basically. Um, okay, cool, what else have we got? Um, yeah, I mean it's worth talking about um, uh, the new mixing and mastering program, you know, bearing in mind the last couple of weeks we have done mixing tutorials and today we're doing mastering, it's definitely worth you guys checking out uh, the new kind of mixing and mastering program which basically packages the um, art of mixing course along with the audio mastering course um, again using the kind of waves plugins as well so if you are into the stuff that we're talking about today and last week and you want to get a bit more in depth in that um, obviously today we, we only really kind of get to, to scrape the surface but if you want to get more involved in that then definitely check out the course um, the next one of these starts on um, the 15th of October but if you want to jump on today, you might be able to jump on the one which started on, on Monday as well. Um, so yeah, just head over to the website, um, click on the programs and the mixing, mixing and mastering is the one for you. Um, uh, one more thing is, is the higher education courses, so the degree level programs, which are the DIP HE and uh, the CERT HE, they're both um, enrolling now and we've got a, a real kind of one or two spaces left, that's it, and they start on Monday. Uh, so you must get your application in today if you want to study to degree level with us. Um, and also, yeah, it's worth mentioning, um, for the first time, we're going to be in Ibiza um, next week on uh, Thursday. We'll be there. We'll be doing a whole day of free DJ workshops. So, yeah, if you're on the island, if you've got mates on the island, anyone who's out on holiday, then um, drop us a line. Tell them about it. It's going to be at S Vive Hotel. Uh, just by Playa de Embossa, and we're going to be doing free DJ workshops with one of the residents of um, SV and uh, Sands. So Carla da Costa is going to be showing you um, basically the kind of introductory skills to learning to DJ for absolutely free. Uh, again, there's more information about that on the blog. 
Um, so if you head over to pointblankonline.net forward slash blog and on the home page, I think you should find maybe a um, fourth post down or something like that. You'll see all the details on um, our free DJ courses in Ibiza. Uh, so yeah, definitely one to kind of spread the word about. Um, and finally, um, it's also worth checking out um, the Zombie Disco Squad Masterclass that we've now got up on the YouTube channel. It's been archived. Uh, wicked class, that one, using Cubase and Ableton Live and, and looking at one of his new tracks. Um, so yeah, definitely worth checking that one out as well. Um, and I think the one other thing to talk about is basically that we're still doing the half price online DJ courses. Um, so if you do want to learn to, to either perform with Ableton Live or learn to DJ using um, Serato, then head over to pointblankonline.net and check out the online DJ courses um, because they're running half price until the end of the month. Um, so yeah, if you want to get involved in that, then drop us a line, just head to the Contact Us page. Um, so yeah, I think that's about it um, for now, but make sure you um, get posting in the chat room. Uh, let us know where you're locked in from and keep up with the questions. Um, we'll definitely kind of answer them as we go um, and we'll try and answer as many as we can really. So yeah, that's about it from me and I'll pass over to JC to look at some mastering. Cool. Nice one, Luke. Cool. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, so we, you know, we've been doing quite a few mixing sessions, two or three mixing sessions, I think, you know, over the last few weeks. So we thought this week we'd look a little bit of the, the mastering, which is basically the, the step after mixing. Uh, and there are a few things that, I mean, today, I mean, basically, I'm using a project. It's a track from Johnny Miller uh, under the name Joshua Black. The track is Terra Firma, and it's a track that is coming from the dubsteps, the, the dubstep on, with Ableton course that we also took for the mastering and basically during the mastering course we've got about 10 or 12 tracks that we're mastering throughout the course in a lot of different genres. Uh, so it's one of the tracks that uh, in week six of the course you can see this track being mastered by a mastering engineer throughout the, each step of the process. You can download the project, it's one of the things that you can do basically. Um, so the first thing I'm, I'm going to do is literally play a little bit of the unmastered version, so that's the mixed version with no nothing on the bus, just the mix as it was. So that's the unmastered, you know, it sounds pretty good already, that's, it's quite a good mix, quite well balanced, uh, it's got nice attitude to it, uh, and that is now the, the mastered version. So as you can notice, obviously it's a little bit louder, uh, a little bit brighter, a little bit more control in the bass. And um, so the idea today is to show you all the steps that are being done in mastering. Uh, and also trying to answer your question. So on the mastering course, we're using Waves. Um, they're really good plugin for mastering. Uh, it's part of using the Grandmaster bundle from Waves. Um, it comes with linear, uh, linear EQ, uh, linear multiband, it comes with the whole bundle of limiters that they have, it also comes with quick tech and the V um, EQ and compressor for more of a vintage sound and we've used uh, quite, quite different piece of, of equipment uh, or, or, or of those devices on this mastering track. So the aim of mastering, what is it? The aim of mastering for us is uh, making sure that you optimize your track so it can be played on a wide range of systems from your iPod to your car, hi-fi at home, uh, mobile phone and, and, and a big club and to make it sound as good as possible across this wide range. So it's always going to be a bit of a compromise to make it sound really good everywhere and also to make it sound really good in context with other commercial release. That's kind of what you're aiming at really. And um, one of the big issues, I'm sure, you know, uh, that we're going to touch a little bit, we're touching a lot on it on, on the course, is war, loudness, you know, the war of loudness. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, it's a big issue in mastering, uh, which it's not a recent issue. You know, a lot of people are thinking, well, it's because now we can use digital limiters and stuff. But it's actually an issue that existed from the 50s. Um, if you, you know, it's all started with music in the jute boxes. Uh, if singles and then artists, a record company noticed in the 50s that one record, we, record would sound louder in a bar <laughs> right. played on the jute box and then more people would dance because it has that kind of feeling that if it's more powerful it sounds better. Mm -hmm. uh, actually 
what I want to discuss with you is that actually it's not the case. It sounds maybe more exciting for five minutes, but in long term, it kind of gets a bit tiring to the ears, I, I think. So, but, you know, it's an important consideration. You know, the concept at the moment is that people tend to think, and it's mostly more, interestingly, we discuss it in the course, it's more artists, I think, than, produ than producers and record company, who, and I've seen it many, many times, you know, on many albums I've produced, where I go to the mastering, we do what we feel is a good mastering, and the artist gets paranoid. Oh, yeah, but it's not as loud as the other band. And that's really, you know, um, so we, we can talk about that if you have any questions, but I'm going to take you through uh, what we've done here. So the first thing in mastering in the chain, often at mastering stage, uh, you're going to have EQ. EQ is the most important tool in mastering. It's about bringing what we call a tonal balance. So you've got a track, and I'm going to get rid of all the plugins we've put across here. And you notice that the way I'm setting up, uh, it's a good way in Logic, I think, to set up, is you've got two tracks, two different tracks, on two different tracks, the same song, the difference being one of them is where I'm going to master and that is my other project. So I can constantly refer to how it was before to how it is now. Am I really making it better? So that's kind of the idea. Um, in terms of metering, I use the metering on the master fader here. Uh, the multi-meter fader is quite a good one in uh, Logic because you can see the frequencies. You see you've got your frequency here. So it's quite a good one to have. You also have the goniometers that give you the phase. You notice here, for example, the big nut bass here with the big circles. The big circle means that this bass is completely out of phase. Uh, for example, it's one way to, you know, it's really important to be able to read that. Um, now, being a master, I can't really do much about it. I'm going to have to live with it. It's kind of out of phase, but we're going to have to make it work because I can't go back into the mix. And that's one of the big things about mastering. I've got a stereo mix. There's not much I can do about it. I've got to make it work. Um, so the first thing we've done is on the EQ is work on the bottom end. One of the big issues um, with limiters, you know, if you got this idea of making it as loud as possible, and let's face it, nowadays, it's one of the consideration, you know. Uh, as an audiophile, I would say, I don't really care about it, but the reality is that you want your tracks to be banging and to compete with other professional releases in club. So, yeah, it's a consideration. So the idea is to make, okay, let's make it as loud as we can. Now, one of the problems with big bass mixes, like this one, it's got a massive bass, this track, a lovely one, but is that limiters when you start limiting and i'm going to bring up my limiter here limiters don't really react well to bases that's the first thing that's going to start distorting have a listen i'm really pushing in on the bass here you see i'm going up to 6 db reduction but you can hear it's distorting a little bit it is distorting a little bit um, so if you're going to want to have to push a track that has big bass one of the tricks is to basically make the bass a bit more bearable. Keep it fat, but work on it. So what we've done on this mix, I'm going to get rid of the limiter for now. I've got several EQ. The linear phase EQ in Wave is really good. Uh, what it is, is linear phase is because it keeps every band in phase, limiting the kind of uh, distortion due to phase shift. I'm not going to go in great detail in there today. We are going in great depth in the course about the difference between normal EQ linear phase EQ, they have advantages, pro and cons, we all discuss it in the course, uh, but the main difference is that here, they're all staying in phase, there's basically a delay between each band to make them completely stay in phase. As a result, you would notice it introduces latency. So as soon as you put the, let, let me compare here, I'm taking the bypass. If I bring the EQ in, do you hear the latency that happens? It takes time because it needs time to calculate, to re- mm -hmm put a line, everything if you like. So what we've done here, the first thing we've done on the EQ is 86K, quite a big dip, minus 4 dB, using a shelf. And you notice instead of doing a massive, you could, instead of curving all that, because you're working on a, on a whole material, it's not like when you mix, you work only on the bass, on the kick. You can EQ a lot more on the individual elements than you can of a whole mix. And I think that's the key in, in, in mastering. Mm -hmm. You do a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit 1 dB here, half a dB here, and all together you're starting to rebalance 
the whole tonal balance of your mix, basically. All your frequencies are starting to reshifting them to a point where it's all in line. That's kind of the idea of mastering. Do you have any questions so far? Um, well, first of all, um, I'll just give the guys a few shout outs. Um, I mean, we've got people locking in from the Netherlands, from the US, from Ireland, from Slovenia, Cape Town, um, Stockholm. Wow, um, cool. Yeah, so yeah, big yeah. audience. Um, one question that has come in um, is, is kind of when you touched on the fact that bass was out of phase. Yeah. Um, someone just asked, obviously we, we can't go into it now, um, kind of in the project, but how, what is the process, but, you know, kind of making it in phase during the mixing process? Uh, you can't because the, I mean, I mean you, you, uh, now you can't, especially on this track, the problem, it's only one bass note that is mm -hmm. out of phase. It's one sample, the, this one. That one. This one. Mm -hmm. It's only that one. So you can't because if I try to rectify the phase for that, everything is going to be affected and what was in phase becomes out of phase by reversing the phase. Okay. So there's not much you can do. It's only one note. Uh, it still sounds good. You mm -hmm. know, I just wanted to point it out and to, yeah, to yeah. show how the disgoniometer was moving. Mm -hmm. If you see that big circle empty in the middle, there's a phase problem as there. As long as it's good on the ears. But so if it sounds good yeah. in the ears, don't yeah. get too obsessed with that, yeah. you know. Uh, but because it's only one note, not much you can do for that. Yeah. That's part of the compromises you need to do at mastering. Um, yeah, I think we've um, uh, we've got another question from yeah. Gavin Boyce who's asked, um, um, what are usually the kind of, um, my problem usually is what levels to mix to pre-master? How do I aim for headroom? Like, I guess. Uh, yeah, that. okay. Yeah, I mean, the idea is to leave a bit of headroom when you mix, because as soon as you start putting EQ in compressor, especially when you boost, mm -hmm. you're going to start clipping. I mean, having said that, I can bring it down. You know, if you give me a mix at zero and I master it, I'll bring it down by three to four dB to make sure I've got enough headroom to start working on the mix. But a good practice is between, three to, between six to three dB headroom when you mix. And then you give that and then you start mastering. Uh, that, that would be my answer for that. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I think, I think we're good on the, on the questions just for now. Um, yeah, just, just keep your questions coming in, keep the shouts in. Um, we just got to give a bit of a shout out to uh, Alex Funzi out to uh, Green Money. Hey, hey, and hey, also to, to Mr. Bristow as well, um, Point hey, Bank Jesus. Uh, so yeah, let's jump back into it. Cool. And I, I will jump on your questions um, nice as they come in. Cool, man. So yeah, so as you look here, there's a big dip at 86, partly because if you listen to those frequencies here, You see, there's a big, that's the big boom, you know, there's a big peak here. We need to tame that. So we went quite big on there. And even by doing that, one of the beauty of the linear phase, it's still quite subtle. If you, you see it, but it's now a bit more controlled. Also, other thing that happened is as, if you noticed here, for example, 80 and uh, 161, Basically, 161 is the octave higher than 86. And often in mastering, you will notice that if you have a problem at a certain frequency, you may have to go an octave lower or an octave higher. And because harmonics happen here, you know, they're natural harmonics, they're an octave literally higher, uh, you may have problems here. So here again, we've done a little dip here and another at 215 because there was a resonance here. And straight away, the bass is a bit more managed. And one of the things I like about working with the individual plugins rather than something like, let's say, Isotop, which is a great mastering tool, you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, uh, I'm sure we're going to have questions about which mastering tools are better yeah, and stuff. And, and yeah. they're all very, you know, they're all pretty good nowadays, basically. Um, they, they sound a bit different, each of them, but it's also about the interface. I like working with the independent because now I've dealt with my bass here and now I can pull up another EQ and start dealing with other issues. So here what we've done, again, it's a massive sub bass and another way to really help to gain more level in your limiter is I put a cut at 22 here. Again, it can be higher, but here we're talking there's a big sub bass, you know, uh, putting it higher, I think, would start affecting the fatness, the subby, and which is completely inherent to that genre. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the sub for that genre, you're yeah. kind of missing the point here, really, you know That's what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So depending on the genre, you may have that higher and lower. Here, I don't think we can go higher than mm -hmm. that, otherwise you're starting losing the stuff. 
Uh, after that, again, five, uh, around 500 here, a little dip. But you see, again, one, one point four, you know, a dB and a half, basically. Again, very subtle. And then to rebalance, we felt that 2K, 5K, and again, you noticed here, we are not far from those harmonics I was telling you about, an octave higher. Mm -hmm. Having a little of mid, let me... So we are dealing with the bottom end here nicely and uh, the low mid here. So now it's a bit tighter, but listen to the top end, or the mid. We feel that the, the mid and the high mids are a little bit, maybe a bit dull, and it needed a little bit bringing that. And that's one thing you do at, at the mastering is to bring a bit more presence, a bit more sparkle to it. So by doing that here, you see how the wind shots, the sound in, the, all the sound in that frequency regions sound a little bit better. However, we felt that that 10K, there's a lot of shimmery per, uh, per, percussions going on on that track. And we felt that that really needed to be kept under control. So that's how we've basically dealt with the EQ. We've added another EQ, which one of my, I've got to say, it's one of my favorite guys. Uh, it's the Puig Tech. It's kind of an emulation of Pool Tech. We've talked about it last week already a little bit in the, during the mixing session. Mm -hmm. I've showed you that on the bass, it works great. Here, strangely enough, we've brought, although I know we've attenuated the bass, but we felt that it needed a bit of sub. So we brought 30 hertz here to bring back the, the warmth. Everything is under control. So you see, we've taken a little bit here, brought up a little bit there. And again, we've brought the very top end. You know, something you do often at mastering is bring that kind of air. A lot of people talk about air. Some EQ even go up to 40K, which is way above what we hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But somehow you bring it up a little bit and it feels, I'm not hearing it, but I'm kind of feeling it. Mm -hmm. You know, here we've done the 16K on the Puig Tech, which is a lovely little air. And have a listen now how it sounds. And you see it's starting to be, that's all our EQ down. So now if we compare, between that to that, the untouched version. Notice the untouched is now louder. It's because with my EQ, I had to bring things down a little bit. What I've done is I want to make sure that when I go from one EQ to the other, you see here I'm on minus 5 dB on this fader. I just wanted to give myself some headroom. That's all it is. So don't worry about the level that I've lost at the moment. I will get it back with the limiter anyway. Um, any any question? Yeah, we've got. Um, I would say there's a couple of questions about the kind of mixing stays, you know, previous to mastering. I definitely would recommend going back through the YouTube channel and checking out. Um, I think the last two or three Friday yeah, forums yeah, yeah. Um, where we did a lot more mixing. I mean, someone's asked. Paul has asked about um, using the plugins that you're using now yeah. on in the mixing stage. Yeah, you and can. I mean, the linear phase. For me, a linear phase has got maybe less of a need in mixing because. It's really about trying to keep, to keep the, 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 all the frequencies in phase over the whole program. So, uh, but like the quick tech, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, I would have it on many, many channels. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, also, Remy has asked um, a similar thing about um, the kind of the levels during the mix down stage. Again, I think that is something we've probably covered in, in last week's or the week before. So definitely go and check those out. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm basically, I'm keeping everything I personally, you can go on the red on individual channels, but I, I personally wouldn't. For me, the kind of the gain, the chain of gain, you know, uh, is quite important. Uh, coming from the analog world, where it was important, otherwise you start distorting the next device. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd be careful of that, even at the mastering and mixing stage. I, I'm keeping everything on the zero until the very last limiting thing, which mm -hmm. is my final. That's my advice, but everybody has, his, has its own practice. Um, we've also got a message from uh, D-Influence, I think it's a bit of a regular watcher, um, asking about um, why you um, don't master like in the project, why, okay. why would you bounce it down? <laughs> yeah, Which yeah, I think yeah. we kind of touched on we a little kind of bit. We kind of tapped, but I, I was waiting for that question. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's, there's two reasons. Is that, as you can see here, I'm using, I want to use my best plugin, basically. The, be the better plugin, quality-wise, tend to, ta to use more CPU. Simple mm -hmm. as that. So I'm using all the CPU I can for mixing with the best plugin I can. And then I do the same for mastering, if you know what I mean. And that's yeah. the same reason that mixing, I would tend to put everything into audio yep. rather than use the use CPU with and the virtual instrument. The thing out for exactly. Yeah. Another reason for it is for me having a bit of lapse of time. 
is a good thing mm -hmm. between both. So you're getting a bit of a perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, the same idea is that normally um, on professional project, I would send my I would go to a mastering place a week later after the album has been done. Mm -hmm. I get the ears of a mastering engineer. He never heard the project before. He brings his own perspective on it, mm -hmm. purely from a sonic yeah, point, I mean, point I think of view. Me, me I know the track inside out. That's right. There's yeah. so much. I've, done, I've taken it as far as yeah. I could. Listen this to guy, it multiple exactly. times. Exactly. Yeah. The guy comes in completely fresh. You're in a room. You're there as the visit. You know, you're just the guest. You let him do. Maybe you're going to guide him. Say, well, I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. But you know, so. Now, most people tend to master their own track, you know, especially for dance music where you're going to put it on Beatport, you're a DJ, you want to play it out in a, on a club, mm -hmm. great, you know, and you can do that, I'm totally for that. But if you keep a bit of distance between the day you've done your mix, it's the same way where you write the tracks, you mix it, maybe you live some days. So you're mm -hmm. getting a, a slightly fresher perspective yeah, on it. Yeah, definitely. So I quite like that idea as well for me, is keeping it separate also because the mindset is different. When I write, when I produce, when I mix, when I master, you, your aims are slightly different. Yeah. So that's kind of like, when I master suddenly, I don't think about the mix anymore. Uh, the kick drum could be better. The bass line could be better. No, no, we are moving on. We've moved on, you know, we're yeah. now at yeah. the stage. You're locked in now. You know what I mean? It's done. I've committed to that. Let's make it sound. I compare it to other records mm -hmm. and then you're in that kind of frame of mind. So that, that's, that's for me why you wouldn't do it at Is the that same something time. you do? Obviously, you're referencing the, the pre-master project there. I would normally do you, have... Do you I normally have no another track as well? To something totally, that you, yeah? totally. Even yeah. maybe depending on the nature of the project, I may have several tracks. Mm -hmm. If I do an album, I probably would have several tracks. But if I do a track, one track like that, I would have at least one or two songs in the same kind of genre. So I yeah, know, you yeah, know yeah. how when I'm competing with... Mm -hmm. You know, something that, you know, is a, a bit of a reference. Everybody thinks, yeah, it sounds great, this track. Yeah, you know, yeah, works yeah. in club, we can yeah. mix. Then that probably, you, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, someone else, Jonathan, has asked if you would ever master using stems. Yeah, it's, I mean, me, no. If I'm mixing my own mix, uh, pff, there's no point me yeah. doing stems. You know, I can go back to the mix if I want to change something. Uh, I think the stem started in America, and it's more used in America. Okay. Uh, partly in hip-hop, just to clean the vocal getting mm -hmm. all yeah. the, the slang out, for example, yeah, for the clean yeah, version, yeah. so it's one reason. But it's also allow you, a, a lot of the stuff, as soon as you put vocal on, on tracks, this is where, this is your main focus in mastering. And suddenly, if you've got to change, if you've got to affect the bass, the snare, and the vocal, you, you're a bit limited. So having a, having a, a, a stems really allows you to treat the vocal separately. If you need to be, de if you need to de-ess the vocal, you don't affect your hi-hat, your cymbals. You know, it's, it gives mm -hmm. you a bit of, Opportunity, but it's, it's I think it's from what I've seen. It's a technique which is more used in the States than in the UK uh, But it's changing, you know, I mean I've, spe I've spoken to quite a few mastering engineers lately who were saying to me It's not uncommon now to have the guy coming with your laptop the full mix mm -hmm. and the guy does Send the whole full mix to the mastering engineer who does his mastering, but he's able to tell can you turn down the kick? Can uh, you do so that? It's got both there. Yeah, 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 you know yeah. what I mean? Okay. So but I think mastering engineers are not big, a big fan of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, but it, it's, it, it happens now. It happens. Yeah. Or on big project, it happens that uh, the guy comes, send the project to the mastering engineer, tell me where I'm at in the mix, do you think it's great? You know, especially mm -hmm. with the kind of home mixing going on nowadays, mm -hmm. it's a great opportunity to say, here's the mix so far, what do you think? Yeah. And you yeah. get another feedback from a mastering engineer point of view, saying, mm -hmm. well, I think the top end is great, but maybe the bottom end is a bit of work on and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. yeah, techniques are changing. Cool. Um, so yeah, let, let's jump back into to JC's tutorial. Um, do keep your questions coming. There's, there's quite a few of you watching, so we are trying to kind of get through them. But yeah, keep them up. Um, anything that we don't get through, obviously, we'll, we'll jump on the forum anyway. Uh, but yeah, over to, cool. to JC. Cool. So now, once you've done your balance, and you know, it doesn't mean that I'm I'm done with it. I could go back to it at any time and start adjusting. You know, uh, I tend to start working on dynamic. Now, this track, we didn't feel that it needed a heavy compression to it. But actually, what we've done, and that's what I wanted to show you, um, Wave's got an interesting plugin. It's a very old plugin, actually. It's the C1, one of their first compression. Uh, they just revamped the interface a little bit. What I like about it is that it's got a split mode with an EQ. What it means is that a lot of people are talking to me about um, multi-band compression, and it's a big thing about mastering. Uh, we're not going 
to go into it, just to let you know now, guys, <laughs> uh, on this session, because there, it's another topic. But again, we are dealing with it in the mastering course quite in more detail. Um, but here, what we've done is literally we, we've applied this compressor, but it only and we're using it as a, a, a frequency conscious compressor. What that means is that we've selected the sidechain here, a certain frequency, and we are only compressing that specific frequency. Mm -hmm. And that's a great plugin to do that. It allows you, instead of compressing the whole track, we are literally compressing only that frequency. And what we've done here is basically compressing around 10K means it's effectively acting as a de -esser. Okay. I don't know if you can hear now because it's going to be a lot quieter, but what we've done here, there was a lot of the, I told you about the, the shimmery hi-hat and stuff like that, which I felt needed to be kept under control. Now, the difference by doing it with the DS uh, compressor that com you know, compresses that specific frequency rather than with EQ is that it's dynamic. With EQ, if I turn down 10K, it's turning down 10K all the way through. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, I'm only attenuating those specific frequency when they happened. So that's yeah. kind of like, what I, I remember having those questions being asked a few mm -hmm. times on, on during those live sessions, and, and that's effectively what we're aiming to do. So let's go back to the uh, project here. So you see the, the compressors working here. Again, very gentle, very subtle, very fast attack, quite fast release, and it's really only attenuating when those hi-hat, those little shimmery stuff are getting a bit offensive. The reason we've done that is that in clubs, when it's going to be played really loud, I think it may be a bit fierce. Mm. So we wanted to keep that a little bit under control so that in the club when it's played, you know, really going for it, it's still going to be quite pleasant yeah, to listen yeah, to. Yeah. That was kind of the idea behind that. And then we've done exactly the same here, but this time at 130, which is where a massive resonance on the bass is still occurring even after uh, the EQ. So have a listen here, you put it on sidechain, and you see those kind of slightly resonance, which I think in a big club, again, on s when the systems are not as great in some clubs, mm. I think it would, it would really help having that a little bit under control. So we are compressing the top end, we are compressing the, those bottom end around 130 hertz, but we're not compressing anything else in the mix. Mm -hmm. That allows you to do that with those kind of compressors. So it's kind of a sweet, neat feature. Really. So job done in terms of dynamic. It's a choice we've made. You know, um, me and Doug, Doug who's worked on the mastering of this track, is a mm -hmm. mastering engineer who's, who's been working. Yeah, it's worth working. mentioning that Doug does D the Doug course. Doug Shearer yeah. does the course, he's teaching it. Uh, we've developed it together. He's a very experienced mastering engineer. He's worked at Hanna House, some of the biggest room in London, mm -hmm. uh, mastered for Gorillaz and several, many other bands. Mm -hmm. um, great guy. So he's mastered that track and taking you through the techniques that he's used, uh, which are professional techniques used with hardware, but mm -hmm. that we've translated with plugins. Yeah. Basically. Which is basically, so you guys, you know, when you do make a track, you can get it ready to, to put out and, and play out in the club, really. Yeah, basically. Which is what we all want to do. Yeah, absolutely, completely, you know. Uh, do we have any questions so far about uh, those questions. techniques? Questions, we've got um, Mr. Faux Incredible, who's asked, um, how much RMS do you uh, look to get in the end? Ah, okay. We're gonna go there now. That was the cool. that was the next genre. Perfect. The, the, <laughs> the next step. Sorry, rather than next genre. Uh, so we'll go into it. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, on in the, the meantime, front? Um, we've got. Um, if you make an album or an EP, is it better to do all the mastering in one project on separate tracks? Yeah. I guess to get an overall feel, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. That, I, I feel it's, it's the best way to do it. For. Yeah. I, I would have them again exactly like that. Mm -hmm. And wh what I love about that is that you can quickly jump one song to another very quickly. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, so for me, it's a nice layout way yeah. of working. And you have get the cohesion reference. across the whole lot. Totally, yeah. you can come back. Uh, it's something we go into the, again in the last week of the, the mastering course actually, yeah. where we take eight, com uh, five or six completely different track mm -hmm. and see how suddenly we've mastered them, but we tweak them a little bit to make them fit a little bit more in the world, yeah. in the same world, you know. They won't completely, you know, because they're coming from a totally different angle, mm -hmm. from acoustic 
some year some writer to big that it's really important though i think for me personally it's something where when you do hear an album or an ep that has a kind of vibe to it it's, it makes a massive difference totally totally Definitely. and you know it's funny as soon as you match the level you notice straight away it's becoming more cohesive already mm -hmm. more coherent yeah you know, it's, yeah uh, so yeah, Remy, if you do want to find out a bit more of that, um, you know, if you are looking to, to kind of get into mastering your own tracks, putting an EP or, or, or an, um, an album together, then definitely check out the mastering course. Um, just have a look for a couple more questions. Um, um, Gavin has asked about um, putting other master tracks uh, to reference. We talked about that. So yeah, yeah. really good idea. Totally. Um, definitely good. You know, pick a track that you love, that you've heard in the club, that you think sounds great and, and use it as a kind of reference point. Um, uh, okay, um, we've also got one from uh, DJ Seabat who said that JC is a genius. Oh, thanks. Big man. ups to you. <laughs> yeah. I didn't go that far, but thanks, <laughs> thanks anyway. Um, okay, yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's about it for now. Um, but yeah, keep them coming. Have you got anyone cool. you want to jump into? Yeah, we can go. Well, we're going to jump into RMS, really, cool. the, the big thing about let's make it loud. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> um, so yeah, you've got a lot of limiters in waves. Uh, great thing about the great uh, the Grandmaster bundle is that it comes with. Let's check it out here. It comes with pretty much every limiter they've ever released. I think apart from the L1, but you've got L2, L3, blah blah blah. So a lot of people are asking what what's the difference is. Um, basically, the L3 is a multi-band limiter, very much like multi-band compression. It comes under two versions actually, uh, the Ultra and the multi. I think some people occasionally uh, are confused about, uh, they think that this one is a one single band, but basically this one is a multi-band limiter uh, under the hood, except that you don't see all the, all the different bands. That's all it is. They are predefined by uh, different presets, basically, by the extreme ear. You see all those presets here, those, what they call profile. They kind of define how the multiband works in terms of attack and release time. Uh, but the difference here is that you can't start affecting the, the, the f each band frequency and move them. Whereas if I use that one, that one here, I could start literally moving my bands uh, at, in different places and start doing that. So that's the main difference. Now with that track, what we could try comparing it is uh, compare with an L2, for example, which is a, a single band compressor, uh, limiter, sorry. So we've got that one and let's pull up that one that we've ended up using for that track. Um, and let's pull it, for example, again. So in terms of getting level, well, your limiter basically is going to do it. I tend to have my output ceiling because that's your final levels at 0 point, minus 0 0.1 or 0 minus 0.3. Both are kind of standard in the industry. Let's put them at 0 minus 0.3 so it gives us a bit of a margin here not to, have a, to clip at all. Uh, and what we could do is put them both at the same level. So basically the idea here, let's have a listen. The more I'm breaking down, the louder la, the la it becomes. That's basically the concept. Mm -hmm. uh, but the more you do it, and you see the reduction that it brings here. You see on the bass here. The more you bring into the limiter, like I said before, you start distorting your big bass. Mm -hmm. That's one of the problems. You know, limiters work really well with fast sound. Like in hip-hop, for example, you really can push them if it doesn't have a big, big, long note bass. But as yeah. soon as you've got long notes with fat bass, limiter starting to struggle a little bit, mm -hmm. which is why we had a lot of work to do on the bottom end originally to start pushing it a little bit. Uh, I think one of the good thing about the limiter here, if we compare it, sorry, bring it back up. So let's put them all together at the same level for now. Uh, so minus 10. And we could try to compare how they sound. So I'm going to do uh, both of them none. So they match. Here we are. Uh, and let, let's compare both limiters. So that's the Ultra Maximizer. It's basically a multi-band. Um, but we haven't tweaked the multi-bands themselves. 
And now it's the L2. You notice for the same amount of reduction, the same kind of loudness, I feel that the ultimate maximizer is, works better on the bass. Mm. Distorting not as much. It's because of its multiband multi -band design. So it's an example where multiband works better. Mm -hmm. So if you have several limiters, I think, you know, a lot of people tell, uh, I see a lot of discussion on forums and YouTube and this kind of, like, no, this limiter is better. And I, I, I tend to think that it depends on the track. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? It really depends on the track. So if you have the luxury to have two or three different limiters, try them on try different the track. Road. And you'll find that, for example, on acoustic stuff, gentle stuff, I'm a big fan of the Sonox. The Sony Sonox, mm -hmm. uh, Sony Oxford collection. I think it's a brilliant limiter, very transparent. Um, there are other places. The PSP is great. Uh, the UAD is great. The Wave is great. Isotope is great. The Macy is great. The Flux is great. I mean, Voxengo is great. You've got a massive collection of really good, decent limiter out there. Mm -hmm. um, try them differently. Download the demo. Have a try. Experiment. Experiment with them. Yeah. With them. And in terms of RMS, I mean, one meter I like about uh, again in the wave is this Doro meter, which is an emulation of a hardware system user. Uh, it's pretty much a standard in a standard in um, broadcasting and, okay. and mastering rooms as well. Um, have a look what it does here. So you see here, I've got my ticks, and here it see I'm seeing my general level. So I would say that my RMS is about minus nine. See, I'm pushing quite loud. It's quite loud mix now. Yeah. Um, and this meter allows you to monitor both the peaks and the RMS. Here as well, you can monitor the phase issue, the others, and as you can see, it's all fine. You know, it's not registering anything. Mm -hmm. So as a master, I think we've got a pretty good master. <laughs> yeah. Really. Well, it sounds good. You know. Uh, and now, if you wanted to look at other stuff you've done, you may wonder. I'm going to close this session, finish this session now. You may wonder why have you got this track uh, chopped up and this one is not. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's because what we've done is, have a listen here, have a look rather here. You see this track. Once you master, what you can do as well sometimes is that once you put a limiter, some parts can become louder, quieter. And what we've done is actually the intro, for example, we felt was too loud. Okay. So when we went into the mix, uh, went it burned, let's compare here. Let's get the click, sorry. So you've got a long intro, very atmospheric and stuff, and then it's banging into the track, it comes into the track. And what we felt was that the intro was a bit too loud, which means when it went into the next one, It didn't quite have the impact yeah, that yeah. we wanted it to have. So it's a big drop. You know, it, it you know what I mean? And so what we ended up doing was turning by 2 dB the intro. So when it comes in, there was an impact. Otherwise, you know, and that's the kind of stuff that you can do at the mastering that people don't realize is that you can go into each section and start rebalancing them to make sure that the big part is actually loud mm -hmm. and big and that the, the drop is not too loud mm -hmm. stuff like that so that's why we ended up chopping up the mix yeah, yeah. And, and and doing that cool um that's cool, kind yeah, of so that's kind of for me that's kind of the overview of what i wanted to show you yeah, a little yeah. bit of what we do in the max touring course mm -hmm. in great details um yeah yeah, so yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of stuff you guys uh, have learned from that. I, I definitely have as well. Um, just to run through a couple of questions for JC, uh, Daniel Kane has said that um, he's been experimenting with, master with mastering for a bit. Um, and just before the limiter, uh, he does a ha harsh effect uh, to add a little width. How recommendable is that? Yeah, 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 you can do that. I mean, to be honest, at mastering stage, you've got a lot of tools that do that okay. for you as well. Uh, Midside, it's something that a lot of people are asking questions about. Midside is used typically, I mean, I could really show you very quickly uh, the last thing. But yes, it's, it's, a good, it's a good way to do it. Whether you want to do it just before the limiter or even to straight at the beginning of the mix, two different possibilities. But for example, Wave have a plugin, which I think I have on this machine, I hope, called Center. 
by doing a bit of that, a lot of mastering engineers use mid-side to make a little bit wider. And the way to do it a little bit wider is effectively to bring the middle, <laughs> let's say, down by alpha dB or, or one even, or, or to boost the side a little bit. And mm -hmm. by doing that, effectively, you're making it wider because mm -hmm. you're making the side a bit wider. Let's go more in the middle of the mix now. And this one feels a bit wider. Yeah, so. you can feel it. Definitely. So yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. It's, it's a practice using mastering as well, playing mm -hmm. with the width a little okay. bit. You've got a lot of tools to do that. Cool. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question, Daniel. Um, another question from uh, Mr. Faux Credible, who's asked about... Um, uh, you, you said that gain staging is important, um, but can you mix it hot? Um, and when yeah. you bounce, just just lower the master fader so it doesn't clip. Yes, but it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, apart that you're sending more, let's say if you mix and you've got a mix, uh, a compressor, a bus compressor on your master fader, the, the louder it goes into it, the more it's going to react. So as long as you keep everything in check, mm -hmm. um, I mean, personally, what you've got to make sure is that don't go, don't clip the master fader at the yeah, mix stage. Yeah. That, that is the bottom line, really. That's the bottom line. So if you're clipping the master fader, you're introducing distortion, mm -hmm. end of the story. So yeah. keep that. But yeah, if you want to have it hot, bring it down, fine. Cool. Fine. Um, another one um, from uh, Manya Fiction, I think it's another regular watcher, um, about um, mastering for vinyl, about the differences there. Yeah, there's a, there's a big section. Yeah. I mean, Doug, who's actually... That's who's Doug, Doug's uh, job, right? He started yeah. like that. He started as a, as a vinyl mastering guy. So we've got a... Uh, he's gone overboard and done a really deep <laughs> section yeah. about yeah. vinyl, how a vinyl is being cut. But I mean, the main thing is that you need to keep that's why this technique of de-icing the top end comes from. Mm -hmm. You've got to keep your top end in check. You've got to make sure the bass is not out of phase, not too much stereo, otherwise your groove is crossing. Unplayable. You yeah, yeah, just yeah, can't yeah. play the vinyl. Uh, things like that to yeah. be considered. So diff different ball game then. Slightly, well, yeah. it's just on the bottom end and the top end, you know. Mm -hmm. But overall, if you do a good mastering, shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, it should okay. go on the vinyl really nicely. Um, yeah, also I should mention there's a really good interview that we did with Doug. Um, that's on the YouTube channel, which is, is kind of basically chatting to Doug about how he, he got into mastering, um, how he became an engineer, how he um, put the course together um, and his background, really. Um, so we talk quite a bit about, about mastering for vinyl. So, yeah, definitely go through that. That should be on the YouTube channel archived um, only a couple of months ago or something like that. Um, OK, cool. We've got um, a message um, from Sun Arc who's asked... Um, He's looking to achieve um, a sound like Led Zeppelin's Black Dog about okay. um, achieving that sound. I mean, again, that's got to be a kind of referencing point. And yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the Led Zeppelin sound comes from the recording stages. You know, right. It's, it's, the, it's their drum sound. It's mm -hmm. the legendary yeah, yeah. Burnham sound that, you know, every indie band that I've worked with are always saying, I want to sound like John Burnham. <laughs> 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 um, you know, there's a lot of quite funny interview on YouTube as well that I've sound, <laughs> seen from many big name producers who, yeah. who, who, has, who have faced that problem. Yeah, it's, it's all about the recording. So get a big drum, you know, it's a bit having those big, heavily compressed mm -hmm. uh, room sound for the drums. Uh, really I guess nice it's, guitar. it's worth m m uh, mentioning that the mastering course isn't just uh, dance music, right? No, it's really going across the range. I mean, we've got uh, three indie, two or three indie tracks, We've got house track, hip hop track, dubstep, uh, singing acoustic, just yeah. literally guitar and, and, and vocals. So now we've done it across the range, really keeping it generic, really going into what we feel, are the techniques used in, uh, you know, there's quite a bit, of, a bit of science as well for you yeah. guys in there, yeah, yeah. but just to make you understand why, you know, when we say don't go too loud, when we say don't do that or do that, or uh, we, we really go into town to explain why, <laughs> basically. Um, yeah, so yeah, if you are, um, yeah, don't be put off by, um, by genre really, um, the course itself goes right across the board, so if you are looking to, to um, work with bands in terms of mastering and, and mixing, then yeah, you can still get involved. Same with the, the Art of Mixing course as well, Totally, right? totally. Um, okay, cool. Um, we've got um, a question, who have we got here? Um, someone we haven't seen yet. Okay, from uh, Sispa, who's asked, um, if you look on your Spectrum Analyzer, are there some rules or tips um, of what the different kind of um, levels should be, low, mid, high, 
Um, or is it just, just the um, taste, really? Is no, it no, no, it's a good... Uh, I mean, pff, have a look here. Let's have a look here, for example. I mean, typically, your bass is going to be... You're it gonna falls have, down. It, it, it yeah. falls down, basically. Yeah. It falls down, you know. That's because the, 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 the low frequency always register more mm -hmm. on the meters uh, and the high less. So you're going to have something slightly like a going down slope. And depending on the, the analyzer you use, it's going to be useful, as you can see here. You see where the peak, the drought, and the, uh, maybe where there's a bit of a yeah. hole are, are, are appearing. But you don't aim to do a curve, a slight curve. It's about listen to what, but it's, it's, it's a reference tool, you know, analyzer, metering, all those are reference tools to kind of reinforce what you hear almost. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, again, use your ears really. Yeah. 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 But yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, the typical curve would be, would mm -hmm. be that, you know. Uh, yeah, for example, I mean, if you see here, you see we, below 30, we don't have too much playing, that's right. If you had a very high level at 30 or very high at above 16, you would have a problem. Mm -hmm. It would typically see, yeah, say to you, well, there's something that is not right here. Um, okay, so we've got um, uh, Giles who's asked, so, it, you know, just to clarify, is there a difference between mastering for an MP3 or CD or vinyl? No, you should, you should master the highest quality. Mm -hmm. You should master 24-bit, uh, at least 44.1. There's a whole discussion about should you master at higher sample rate, uh, again, don't have the time to go into that, but it's yeah, in the course. We discuss, the course. It, we discuss it as well. Uh, what's the pro? What, what are the cons? What you have to understand is that uh, as soon as you change sample rate, you're changing the bit depths, the, the, the digital file. You know, digital, digital mastering is as soon as you change something, like even 1.2 dB, you're changing the bit depth of the file. You're mm -hmm. changing things in the file. That, that kind of what we make you aware of. Um, yeah, one of the reasons of MP3, as soon as you convert the file, for example, I've noticed last time I did a mastering, it was in 48 and I turned it 44 per, for a CD. And at 48, I wasn't picking, I, wasn't, I didn't have any others. I bring it into 41 after conversion back into my DAW and it was picking. And it's one of the things that we talk about, about uh, interpolation, intersamples, all those kind of slightly more um, th digital audio theory. Uh, so, you, yeah, you've got to be careful with MP3. If you are too loud, you're going to bring a bit more distortion. But, you know, the MP3 should be done at the end. Never master an MP3 file. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, unless you don't have the choice. And I know mastering engineers who have had to master <laughs> MP3 file and usually they're not happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, just, just some kind of final bits running through, really. Um, Barry has asked, I guess this is a bit more of a personal question for you, JC. If you... Um, think, you know, personally that using digital tools for mastering is enough or would you like to get on, on real gear, on analog gear to get that last bit of... If I have five grand to spend on an EQ, yeah. I, I would love to, but I don't have that luxury. Uh, but <laughs> Not many of us do. No, exactly. You know, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, there's a whole discussion, you know, you, you can read a lot of stuff on, on gear slots and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I think analog gear, especially with EQ, especially with EQ, I think. But anything, you know, if it's Valve, you're just putting it through and it's gaining a little bit of, you know, je ne sais quoi. Um, <laughs> and it's the same with EQ, you know, they're, they're a bit more pleasing, they're, there's something about it. It's a matter of taste, you know. You're going to have people, like maybe mastering engineer like Bob Katz, who's, you know, he's a big name on mm -hmm. the scene. A lot of people are yeah. been really active on blogs and, and, and stuff and wrote a really good book, actually. Uh, he's a digital man and he doesn't feel that analog sounds better. Okay. Uh, I disagree. I think analog sounds better. <laughs> it's, you know... Uh, it could go on. Yeah, on. exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I think nowadays with mastering, I think people tend to use both. Yeah. In yeah, big yeah, professional yeah. mastering places, you know. Uh, just because, you know, brick wall, digital limiter, you need one. If you want that kind of volume nowadays, mm -hmm. it's digital. And I think it's got, it's got a place for both. Yeah. I think. Okay. Um, a quick one about the, the mastering course itself. Manu Fiction's asked if you'll learn about 5.1 mastering as he's possibly looking to do stuff for movies. No, no we haven't gone into that into the course, mm -hmm. but the technique supplies, you know, the difference yeah. is the monitoring system and that you need to have a setup. But you're going to apply the same, the same, pretty much the same, okay. the same rules. So, um, and I guess it's if you were shooters, interested, we, we could yeah. apply. We yeah, could apply. Yeah. And, and also because our courses always have, you know, you've got a tutor with you. Mm -hmm. So, 
he can adapt yeah. to your needs yeah, yeah. And, 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 and help you and guide you for yeah. that. I mean, and I mean, even if, even if possibly they couldn't answer the, you know, the question there and then, I'm sure they can point you in the right direction oh, totally, and definitely totally, get you on, totally. on that I mean, road. I mean, really. you know, I, and, and, uh, and our, master, the, our tutors have the experience of 5.1, it's yeah. just that in the course we don't deal with it. I find that the problem, you know, the key for, master, I mean, for mastering and mixing is the monitoring. Mm -hmm. So it's hard enough to get a really good stereo monitoring setup where you can trust the environment. Yeah. With the 5.1, the key for you at home, if you've got that, you really need to gonna work hard on getting this monitoring environment right. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that is the key, I think, for me. Okay. After that, you, same, same applies. Cool. Um, I think we'll just run through one final one. Jonathan's asked um, about um, what type of dither do you recommend when bouncing? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't got into dither at all on, the, on that one. I mean, basically, if you're dithering from one, the, the first rule is that you're mastering at 24 bits, you're dithering because you're going, let's say, to for a CD at 16 bits, you need to dither. If you don't dither, what you're having is what we call quantization error. Mm -hmm. Basically, you're, you're missing bits. You know, you're taking bits out and it introduces a little bit of distortion. It's quite minimal, but from 24 to 16, it's there. Yeah. You're going to hear it. So dithering, there's a lot of different dither, uh, the waves, the, the logic one. Uh, we, talk, uh, we are going in quite depth in the course as well. Some dithers are literally uh, a white noise, same level across the range. They're the kind of flat dithering. Or you've got what after that are known as shaped, shaped dither. Uh, and they are kind of EQ'd in a way so that the noise is EQ'd out where the ears are the most receptive. So you get more of a curve. Try out different dithering. In the course, we do demonstration about literally going through four or five different dither. Have a listen. Depending on the track, some will work better than others. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, you know, you're going to have to train your ears. It's not something that's going to sound obvious. Uh, it's something that you're going to more have a, a feeling about mm -hmm. it. A good way to listen to dithering, I find, is listen to the end of the track, like the tail, the fade, really loud on headphones. Okay. That's one yeah. way to train your ears yeah, to, yeah. to pick up because we basically we're talking a level of minus at 16 dB. I think I may be wrong, but I think it's about 90 minus 94 dB. Okay. Like a white noise at yeah, minus, yeah. you know, so yeah, it's really yeah. low. Yeah. You know, so to to pick that up, you're gonna have to train your ears. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. I, th I mean, I think uh, that's about it. We're probably gonna wrap up there. Um, we hit the one hour mark. Um, so yeah, there's a still a few questions there, but um, I'll definitely jump on um, the comments once the, the video is archived and I'll get all those questions answered. Um, and yeah, I mean, we said it last week, but if you do have any suggestions for Friday Forum Live, if there's something specifically you want us yeah. to cover, um, you know, not just in mastering, not just in mixing, in, in general, kind of general production stuff, even DJing as well. Um, do post your comments and we'll try and um, fit something in really, if there's something specific you want to see. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, you know, again, if you want, if you fancy uh, getting a kind of a live DPR, I quite like, I really like this yeah, idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. You know, so if you do want to see your project here, I mean, don't be nervous, you know, like send in your projects and we'll take a look at them. You know, feel free to, to email me with the project and with anything specific that you want us to look at. You know, we'd be really happy to do it. I yeah, be because great. then you would really see what, what it is you get when you take a course with us. Yeah, you know, exactly. this, this, um, personal feedback mm -hmm. from, 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 from your tutor. So yeah, I'll put my email on the um, on the comments, but yeah, if, if any of you do want to send a project in with a bit of info, just uh, hit me up on luke at pointblanklondon.com um, and I'll get straight back to you really. Um, so yeah, all, the, all that's left to say really is thanks for watching. Make sure you keep up with the Facebook, um, which you can find at facebook.com forward slash pointblankcollege. Um, obviously keep up with the YouTube channel, all the stuff there, um, the blog as well. Um, and yeah, we'll see you next week for um, the next Friday Forum Live. So thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.